The ill-fated Hindenburg on her last flight sails over New York. These pictures made from a Pathé news plane less than four hours before the tragedy show the world's largest airship heading for Lakehurst, New Jersey. Over Newark's famous auto skyway, the airship was hailed by thousands who little dreamed it was their final glimpse of the Hindenburg. And you are about to see the pictures he got when the ship exploded. Those aboard leaping for life from a flaming inferno. The actual crash of the Hindenburg. An airship destroyed in less than half a minute. Get the charter, get the charter. It's rising, it's rising, it's rising terrible. Oh my, get up the way, please. It's running and bursting in the flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks are this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's running. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, it is. It's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke is flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground. Not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity, all the past. I'm sure you're familiar with the Hindenburg disaster, which occurred on May 6, 1937, when the hydrogen-filled German airship burst into flames and was destroyed while attempting to land at the Lakehurst Naval Air Station, New Jersey. But you probably never heard of an airship disaster that happened 15 years earlier with a U.S. Army airship called the Roma. Hello, I'm Randall Franklin, instructor of Test and Evaluation Engineering at the Air Force Institute of Technology School of Systems and Logistics at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. In the following video, we're going to take a look at the short and tragic history of the Roma. Whether you are a student or practitioner of systems engineering, airworthiness, safety, risk management, or test and evaluation, I hope you will find this story interesting. First, what is an airship? These are lighter than aircraft, sometimes called LPA craft, having propulsion and steering systems and held aloft by a large gas envelope or bag filled with a buoyant gas such as hydrogen or helium. They're also known as dirigibles for their directional control or dirigibility. Airships come in three types, non-rigid, rigid, and semi-rigid. The non-rigid airships rely on gas pressure inside the envelope to maintain their shape. You would know these as blimps. Rigid airships have an internal structure inside the entire gas envelope. They are sometimes called zeppelins. Between the rigid and the non-rigid types are the semi-rigid airships. These have a rigid keel that runs along the bottom of the envelope. The Roma was of the semi-rigid type. The U.S. Army had experience with lighter than aircraft before Roma entered its inventory. In fact, the Army's first powered aircraft was a non-rigid airship called the Baldwin Dirigible, tested and formally accepted in 1908 as Signa Corps Dirigible No. 1. However, by 1919, the Navy had been assigned responsibility for airship development and was authorized two airships. Brigadier General William Billy Mitchell, the Assistant Chief of the U.S. Army Air Service, was concerned that the Air Service had no large airship. So, in 1920, he convinced the Army to purchase the semi-rigid dirigible, the Roma, from Italy. The Roma was the largest semi-rigid airship ever built. 100 feet longer than a football field, it measured 410 feet long, 82 feet wide, and 90 feet high. 11 gas compartments containing a total of 1.2 million cubic feet of hydrogen provided lift and delivered a useful payload of 18 tons. Built in 1919, the ship was designed for commercial possibilities rather than military requirements. The Roma's semi-rigid structure consisted of a keel, triangular and cross-section, which ran along the entire external undersurface of the envelope. The keel was built from five meter long steel girders, each girder composed of three parallel tubular steel members connected by a joint at the end. When viewed down its longitudinal axis, the keel formed a triangle vertex down with the base along the bottom of the envelope. Maximum height and width of the keel was approximately 13 and a half feet by 15 and a half feet. Within the keel were the control cabin, passenger cabin, a passageway, fuel, and ballast. Six outriggers extended out from the keel to hold each of the six engines. The metal framework was covered with cloth, giving the Roma its characteristic ventral fin. To help retain the shape of the airship's nose, 
A 45-foot diameter tubular steel nose cap was attached to the forward end of the keel and covered with fabric. Practically no internal pressure was required to maintain its form under flight conditions. Put another way, due to the low pressure in the envelope, a very strong nose stiffener was necessary. A ladder integral to the nose cap, visible in this photograph, allowed a crew member to ascend from the keel outside the envelope but inside the nose cap to a hatch in the upper part of the nose cap for observation. Power to the Roma was provided by six 12-cylinder Italian-built Ansaldo engines, maximum 450 horsepower at 1650 RPM, directly connected to 10-foot, 11-inch pusher propellers. The engines were arranged in pairs along the keel, port and starboard, supported by the outriggers. The dry weight of the Ansaldo was 1,018 pounds, giving it a 2.26 weight to horsepower ratio. Attached to the keel in the stern was a 65 foot wide, 16 foot high, 10 foot deep box-like assembly comprised of three elevators and eight rudders. These control surfaces were activated by helm-like wheels in the control cabin located two-thirds of the way forward. A side-facing wheel on the starboard side of the control cabin activated the elevators. Either one of two forward-facing wheels activated the rudders. The controls were connected to the elevator rudder assembly by wire cables that ran along the lower part of the keel. Engine speed was commanded from the control cabin to crew members at the six engine stations by means of a signal system like that of a ship. A similar signal system controlled ballast. The nautical paradigm of air ships was evident. What did the air service have in mind for the Roma? A number of possible uses were considered. A November 1921 memorandum for the Chief of Staff stated that Roma would be used for giving airship training to pilots and likewise transporting material from point to point in order to determine the military advantages of this method of transportation. Between November 1921 and January of 1922, the Aerial Age Weekly reported that the air service plans for the Roma included long distance reconnaissance, photographic missions, coast patrol, and advanced instruction at the airship school at Langley Field and carrying supplies for heavier than air units. The January 30, 1922 issue reported that a completely equipped photographic room was being added in which vertical photographs may be developed and printed within 30 minutes and delivered by parachute. The Roma will be able to take excellent airscapes much more satisfactorily than from aeroplanes. The article concluded the Army Air Service feels that great strides in the development of our lighter-than-air program will be possible due to the operation of this ship. To take possession of the Roma, the Air Service, in March 1921, sent a detachment of officers and enlisted personnel to Italy. By this time, the Italians had flown the ship approximately 20 times. The Italian hosts gave the visiting airmen, along with the American ambassador to Italy, other distinguished guests, and an American journalist, an eight-hour familiarization flight. The sortie included a lavish dinner, complete with wine and turns at the helm. Launching the Roma from an aerodrome near Rome, approximately 15 feet in altitude, the Italians had hoped to overfly Mount Vesuvius, approximately 4,200 feet in altitude. The attempt was aborted when Roma failed to gain sufficient altitude. The Ansaldo engines were blamed. The American journalist on board observed that two or three of the Ansaldos are usually on strike when they are supposed to be running. Nevertheless, over the next two months, the Roma was disassembled, packed into 87 crates, and loaded on a ship for transport to the United States. Departing Genoa, Italy in May, the ship arrived in New York in June and then proceeded to the U.S. Naval Base at Hampton Roads, Virginia. The crates were then transferred to barges for transport to Langley Field. On August 10th, the crates were unloaded and moved to a hangar where the airship would be reassembled. Inspection of the fabric generated some concern. A report by the Air Service Engineering Division, lighter than air section, described much of the envelope material to be inferior to that manufactured in the United States. In addition, some fabric was described as evidently old and had been handled excessively. Although some sections of the envelope, such as the nose cap fabric, were in serviceable condition, more important parts, like the envelope, sections that retained the lifting gas, 
were found to be deteriorated. Ominously, an early 1922 memo by the Chief of the Air Service and a February 20th letter by a McCook Field civilian technician mentioned the poor condition of the gas envelope. A new one had been ordered from Italy. Unfortunately, delivery was not expected until that summer. The Engineering Division report assessed these fabrics to have a remaining service life of five to eight months. This included gas compartment number one, the one at the ship's nose. In addition to her 11 hydrogen gas compartments, Roma had six air cells inside the main gas envelope called ballonets, which could be pumped full of air to maintain the shape of the gas envelope. The Engineering Division report described the permeability of the ballonet material as high, probably due to age. Overall, more than 140 holes have been found in the fabric covering. Before Roma's first point-to-point -point in the United States flight, the Air Service had it added a radio room that was designed, built, and installed at Langley Field, which added to the overall weight and may have affected the weight and balance. Remember, the photograph room was added as well. Could these contributing factors been a factor in its weight and buoyancy? In November, the reassembled airship with original envelope and six Ansoldo engines was deemed ready to fly, and on 15 November, the Roma made her first flight in the U.S., taking off from Langley Field at 9.40 in the morning. The Roma remained in the area for an hour, then crossed Hampton Roads and flew over Norfolk, a distance of approximately 12 miles. At 11.22, the flight was marred when an aluminum door blew off and struck a propeller blade, forcing the engine to be shut down. Apart from this incident, the ship's captain reported that the only problem was with the Ansaldo engines. He was quoted as saying they were much too cold during the entire flight and it was impossible to warm them up to running temperature. The radiation surface of the Ansaldo was very large, yet had been designed for a warmer climate. The Ansaldo engines further harmed their sagging reputation the following month. On 9 December, the Roma was scheduled to fly from Langley Field, Virginia to Bowling Field, Washington, D.C., but Langley crews could get only four of the six engines running despite pouring boiling water into the radiators, and the chief of the air service ordered the flight to be canceled. Barely over a week later, on 17 December, Roma's formal christening ceremony at Bowling had to be postponed four days due to engine problems. On the day of the postponed christening, the Roma had to fight stiff headwinds from Langley for five hours with only three of her six engines operating. She arrived at Bowling Field three hours late. High-ranking officials and distinguished guests, including the Italian ambassador, the secretary and assistant secretary of war, the new chief of the air service, and the daughter of the assistant secretary of war, who was to break a bottle of liquid air on the airship's nose, were kept waiting in frigid temperatures for the ship's arrival. The ceremony was considerably abbreviated. The planned ride for the distinguished guests was canceled, partly due to weather, partly to the bulky engines, and the Roma was ordered back to Langley by the Chief of the Air Service. With the aid of a tailwind, she made the return trip in only two hours and 40 minutes, and arrived with only one engine running. A northwest gale battered the airship as Langley crews pulled the Roma into her hangar. Even before the Roma's first U.S. flight, the Air Service had apparently contemplated substituting Ansaldo engines with the American-built Liberty 12A engine at such time as they will require replacement. But now dissatisfaction with the Ansaldo engines was running high. Correspondence on January 7, 1922 from the Chief of the Air Service to the Engineering Division at McCook Field, Dayton, Ohio reportedly directed that the Roma would not fly again until equipped with Liberty engines. That same day, a power plant engineer departed McCook Field to oversee their installation. Rated at 410 horsepower, but weighing only 710 pounds dry, the Liberty 12A delivered more power per pound than the heavyweight on Saldo. Furthermore, it was deemed more suitable for the U.S. climate. The Liberty was considered superior to any other aviation engine in its day and had been produced in great numbers during World War I. Liberty engines and parts would be much more available than its Italian counterpart. Apparently, the Roma came with only two spare Ansaldos. Long duration flights would require the engines to run continuously for extended periods, raising the possibility they would have to be overhauled or changed out at their destination. 
but air service mechanics understood the Liberty engine, the availability of Liberty engines and its trained mechanics would have been especially appealing. So would the weight savings. An air service engineering division report stated, with the application of Liberty motors, approximately 1,200 pounds will be saved, which can be used for additional fuel if desired. According to a January 1922 issue of Aerial Age Weekly, the principal reason leading to the decision to supplant the Ansaldo with the Liberty is to have the Roma make a number of long-distance flights to Scott Field and to Texas. It's anticipated that eventually these flights will be extended to the Pacific Coast. To accommodate the new balloon airship mission, many new facilities were built, most notably an airship hangar second in size only to the Naval Station at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Apparently, the Army planned to fly the Roma to Texas, Illinois, and beyond. There was also some expectation that the Liberties would deliver improved performance. Maximum speed of the Roma with the Ansaldos was variously listed at 67 miles per hour, with the Liberties 80 miles per hour. In December 1921, the Air Service Engineering Division at McCook Field conducted a destructive whirling test of an 11-foot, 4-inch diameter right-hand tractor propeller to be used on Roma's Liberty engines. The propeller of conventional design for the Liberty 12A at 340 horsepower at 1400 RPM was subjected to a five-hour test that reached over 524 horsepower at 1435 RPM. According to the test report, the standard air thrust for that propeller at this speed was 1844 pounds. No similar data could be found for the Roma and the Ansaldo engines. The report included several graphs comparing horsepower, RPM, thrust, torque, and blade deflection. Noting that nothing unusual was noticeable throughout the test, the report concluded it is considered safe to use this propeller on the Roma airship. A January 1922 issue of Aerial Age Weekly reported, it is expected that the maximum airspeed of the Roma with the new Liberty engines will be nearly 75 miles an hour, which will, of course, enable her to fight any wind that she may encounter and arrive at her destination without mishap. The following account is pieced together from several sources. The first flight of the Roma with its new Liberty engines is scheduled to launch from Langley Field on February 21, 1922. Operationally, the Air Service had planned on a crew of 18 for flights of 12 hours or less. For longer flights, the number was 27. But on this day, 45 souls are on board, 17 officers, 20 enlisted personnel, and 8 civilians from McCook Field. Pre-flight is completed at 12.45. At 1.45, Roma lifts off, tail first, and then levels. All six Liberty engines are operating. At an altitude of approximately 500 feet, the ship commander orders cruising speed and heads toward the Chesapeake Bay. At approximately 900 feet, engines are ordered to run at 1100 RPM. The officer operating the elevator control finds it difficult to keep the nose up. A crew member is ordered to ascend the ladder to the hatch in the nose cap to inspect the exterior of the airship. Roma reaches the mouth of the back river and turns south along the shoreline toward Old Point Comfort. The crew waves to people at Fort Monroe below. Observers in the nearby town of Phoebus notice that the nose looks crinkled up. Roma heads out over waters towards Willoughby Spit. Once over the spit, Roma turns toward the Norfolk Naval Station on the opposite side of Willoughby Bay. Over the Naval Station, the crew now notices the upper curve of the envelope's nose is flattening at approximately 215 and an altitude of less than 1,000 feet. A vibration shakes the ship, throwing some crew members to the deck. Roma pitches 45 degrees nose down. The crew member, who had just stuck his head outside the nose cap, felt the ship, quote, tilt up from the back and start to slide down. The officer at the elevator control strains to raise the nose, but it does not respond. A civilian at the aft engine station mistakenly assumes the pitch down was intended to bring the ship over the speed course, which he understood was planned for the flight. The commander orders engines cut. Center and aft engines are stopped. The forward engines continue to run. 
perhaps the operators were thrown out of position. The crew reports the keel is slowly buckling and the elevator rudder assembly is coming loose. Observers on the ground notice this structure swing loose at an angle of about 45 degrees. Ballast is thrown overboard as the crew attempts an emergency landing at the Norfolk Country Club golf course. The ship does not reach it. The nose is collapsed and the controls are jammed. Approximately 20 seconds after the, under, after the uncommanded pitch down, the nose of Roma strikes the ground at the Army Quartermaster Depot in Norfolk. The envelope brushes an electric line. Sparks ignite the hydrogen, which in turn set the gasoline tanks on fire. Flames engulf the stricken ship. 34 of the 45 souls on board perish. Only three escape without injury. Roma's final flight had lasted barely 30 minutes and covered approximately 25 miles. Several theories emerged regarding the cause of the crash. A board of three Langley officers investigated the incident but reached no definite conclusion. The board did report that pressure in the forward gas cell had dropped due to a blocked air scoop, which would have fed a ballonet with atmospheric air. The board concluded this caused the nose to fold inward, which in turn buckled the keel and broke the controls. Here's another possibility. As the nose cap slowly collapsed, it acted as a control surface, forcing the nose downward, which could not be overcome by elevator control. Later writings seem to corroborate the investigating board's report, pointing to the nature of semi-rigid airship design. Due to the low pressure in the envelope, the nose cap and its juncture with the keel had to be strong enough to withstand air loads. At increased speeds, this factor becomes critical. Perhaps supporting this theory was the common notion that the Liberty engines were too powerful for the Roma. Since a crew member had expected a test run over a speed course, could the ship have exceeded a safe speed earlier in its test flight? The duration of the flight and the distance traveled would seem to suggest this. Others blame the deteriorated gas envelope. Ultimately, Roma's catastrophic failure may have been caused by a confluence of all of these factors. U.S. Army testing of airships advanced considerably over the next few years. Between April of 1925 and February of 1926, extensive tests of the 282-foot-long semi-rigid airship RS-1, a helium-filled airship, were conducted at Scott Field, Illinois. Construction of the RS-1 was aided by the use of water model tests, full-scale ground tests, which focused on measuring the loads on the keel and envelope, compared results with the water model tests. Five phases of full-scale ground tests preceded the first flight test. The crew for the flight tests was composed of experienced officers and enlisted personnel. In August of 1928, the Air Corps published its results in a 50-page report that included exhaustive, detailed engineering data along with recommendations for future test procedures and instrumentation for airship testing. The report observed, the flight tests of the RS-1 are probably the first in aeronautical history in which it has been attempted to measure the strains and the structure of a semi-rigid airship. Perhaps more interesting, though, is this conclusion. The envelope of a semi-rigid airship is of great assistance to the keel in resisting transverse shear and bending loads. Whether or not this factor was at play in the Roma tragedy can only be surmised. I want to thank the National Museum of the United States Air Force, the Langley Air Force Base Public Affairs Office, the Virginian Pilot, and other valuable sources for providing the information in the reconstruction of the Roma mishap. Regardless of your area of study, I hope you found this video educational, interesting, and informative. Thank you for your attention.